Hey guys, Derek here from Back to Reality, and this will be an update to part three of our video series all about constructing our garden fence. If you missed those original videos, I'll put a link in the description as always. But the reason why we're making this update is because unfortunately, as you'll see in a moment, the staples that we originally used to attach our fencing onto our fence posts have just not held up as well as we had hoped they would. So in this video, we'll first take a look at why they failed, and then we'll explore several other options and put them to the test to figure out which one will be the best option for us longer term. But before we jump into it, I should mention that I originally recorded this video on a windy afternoon several days ago, but during the editing process decided that I should re-record this intro for two reasons. For starters, in that original intro, I said that this would be a short update video, but if you've seen the timeline, you'll know that as it turns out, I ended up taking a much deeper dive than I originally anticipated. And second, throughout the video, I make a number of references to the T50 staples that we used originally. But since then, I've actually learned quite a bit more about them. So I've added that bonus information onto the end of this video, and I encourage you to stick around to see it. But in the meantime, let's jump back to a few days ago and take a look at this fence. So as you may recall from our previous videos about this fence, when we initially installed the fencing onto the posts, we just used these regular old T50 staples. These are the same type that you'd use in a standard staple gun. And the reason why we chose these staples is because, first of all, they're super cheap, you can find them pretty much anywhere, and they're really easy to work with. Plus, these staples in particular are galvanized, which means that they're resistant to rust. And you want that if they're going to be outside in the weather for potentially years. And they're 9 16 of an inch, so a little over half an inch long, which we hoped would give us plenty of holding strength in the wood. But that's actually the problem, because though these staples did a great job of attaching the fencing initially, as it turns out, they didn't do a very good job of holding it long term. So right now, for example, this fencing is not actually attached to the fence post at all, except for a couple of staples at the top and a few more down at the bottom. So this fencing has been up now since the end of 2020, meaning it's gone through two winters, and each spring we've had this problem where we've had to restaple pretty big sections of the fence onto the posts, which, you know, I mean, once a year, it's not really that big of a deal, but my concern is that this will just get worse and worse over time, meaning that this fence will end up being a constant source of aggravation for us. So I'm really hoping we can come up with a better option that'll hold the fencing more permanently and rarely needs to be fixed. But before we can find a better solution, we first have to fully understand the problem and figure out why these fasteners failed. And for that, I think we'll have to look a little bit closer. Now, my first theory about the staples was that despite being galvanized, perhaps they were just rusting through anyway. And as you can see from this one, they do, in some cases, rust pretty bad. However, the staple itself is still completely Completely intact, and it's the fencing that seems to have worn through. So my assumption is just that the wind has caused this to rub, and over time it eventually just broke. So that seems to be one option, but then we do have another. For example, right here you can see that there are holes where there used to be a staple, but the staple itself is gone. So I assume in that case the wind has caused this to pull on the staple, and over time it eventually just worked its way out. And it seems like that is the biggest culprit. Here's another one here, and another one here. Plus, if we look down here at the bottom, here's an example of a staple that is still attached in half, but the other half has let go. And so, again, the fencing is free. So despite the advantages of using staples, they're obviously not foolproof. The main issues seem to be that even these longer staples simply come free over time, and the thin metal wears against the wire fencing until the wire itself breaks and comes free as well. And of course, some of the staples also appear to be rusting despite being galvanized. And while I haven't found any examples yet of any of the staples actually breaking as a result of it, I'm sure that's only a matter of time as well. But either way, it looks like T50 staples just aren't going to cut it. So now, let's go take a look at what I hope will be some better options. Now, in preparation for this fence upgrade, I first spent quite a bit of time looking into what other people had tried. And as a result, I've narrowed it down to six options that I think have the most potential for us. But as usual, I'm not suggesting that these are the only options. So if you have another solution that works really well, by all means, please let us know in the comments. But in our case, based on our experience with the staples, we wanted a solution that would satisfy the following criteria. 
We want them to be inexpensive and easy to use, but we also want them to be rust proof, unlikely to wear through the fencing over time, and most importantly, unable to come free from the fence posts. Plus, if possible, we'd prefer it if they were readily available at the local hardware store and not require any specialized tools. So with those in mind, here's what we came up with. First up, and this one should probably have been obvious from the beginning, Fencing staples. These ones are three quarters of an inch, and unlike the T50 staples, they use a hammer instead of a gun. In theory, they should have the same holding power as two small nails. And because they're made from wire that is round and thick instead of flat and thin, I'm hoping they won't wear through the fencing so quickly. Now, I should mention that I hadn't really considered these initially because I just thought that they were overkill for chicken wire and hardware cloth, but, uh, Lesson learned. Anyway, next we have some short deck screws and washers. This tip actually came from those who use chicken wire for its original purpose, chicken coops. So if they're good enough to protect hens from coyotes, then I hope they should also be good enough to protect corn from raccoons. And the third option is very similar, but instead of two parts, these lath screws combine the washer directly into the head, meaning one less step for us. But if washers don't inspire confidence in either form, then the next option is to simply screw on a thin strip of wood, like this one by two strapping. The main advantage to these is that they usually come in eight foot lengths, which is the same height as our posts. And rather than just securing the fencing at the screws, they also indirectly hold it in place for from top to bottom. But if you'd rather avoid staples and screws altogether, then our fifth option is to simply wrap a piece of wire through the fence and around the posts. Or finally, even easier, just use a cable tie or zip tie. Now, my instinct says that all of these will likely work just fine, but I think I'll prefer the lath screws the most simply because they seem like they'll be the quickest and easiest option. But now that we know what we're working with, let's head back out to the fence and put each of these to the test. We'll start with the fencing staples, which you can basically just hammer in like a nail. But from what I've read, others recommend holding them in place with a pair of needle nose pliers to prevent accidentally smashing your thumb. This feels a bit awkward to me, but judging by the nicks and cuts already present on my fingers, this is probably some advice that I should strongly consider taking. My main concern going into this solution was that it would be difficult to hammer onto the springing posts, but despite the bouncing, it actually wasn't much of a problem, so I wouldn't worry about that after all. And as for the grip strength, the difference between these and the regular staples is like night and day. So somewhat predictably, I'd say that the fencing staples work great for exactly their intended purpose. Next up are the deck screws and washers. I think these ones are pretty self-explanatory, but basically I'll just pop the screw through the washer and then use a drill to fasten it onto the post. Once again, these hold incredibly well, so there's no way I'm removing this by hand. And while I'm no Superman, I am confidently stronger than your average raccoon. One quick note though, is that I think it's best to treat these like hooks, because the climbing critters will be pulling down on the fencing rather than out from the post. So you'll want the fencing to hang on the screw and then use the washer to simply lock it in place. And as expected, the lath screws work exactly the same way, but in one piece instead of two. I also noticed that the heads are actually a bit smaller in diameter when compared to the washers I chose, so that may be a slight disadvantage, but either way, both of these options are super easy and seem to hold really well. Next, onto the wooden strapping. In this case, I just held it up, put a screw in the top, and then added a few more down to the bottom. The only annoyance I found with this method is that the wood splits really easy, so I'd recommend pre-drilling the holes. It's an extra step that does take a bit more time, but in the long run, I think it's necessary. Once again, this should be just as resistant to climbing animals as all the previous methods, since it's really all about the screws, but I do like the fact that the wood holds the fencing to the post all the way from the top to the bottom. I feel like it would prevent some of the flapping that tends to happen in the wind, and over time that might decrease the wear and tear on the chicken wire. And speaking of wire, on to option five. But as you can see, I struggled quite a bit to wrap this around the post on my own. However, I eventually realized that it was easier to work from the inside of the fence rather than the outside. And there's likely a better way to finish this off, but after wrapping it around twice, I just twisted the ends together and trimmed off the excess. Now, personally, I think this should probably hold okay, but it's definitely the sloppiest option so far. I felt much better about it after securing it with a screw, but in that case, I might as well just skip the middleman and ditch the wire altogether. And finally, the zip ties are nearly identical. 
but having already learned my lesson from the wire, I found that it was easiest to insert the tie through the fencing on the outside, then come around and fasten it from the inside. But if I were to choose either of these methods for the entire fence, I'd definitely wait for Paula's help rather than trying to do it on my own. And in comparison to the wire, it was a bit easier to get a tight hold on the zip tie, but either way, in my opinion, these were no match for any of the other methods. All right, so now that we've tried them all, let's go have a chat about which one I think will work best on our fence. Now, before I try to rank these and make a final decision, I think it's fair to say that any of these options would work just fine and all of them would be vastly superior to the staples we originally used. But if we compare them to the criteria I mentioned earlier, then I think there'll still be some clear winners and clear losers. And to keep things simple, I'll award each method points based on its ranking in each of the categories. Six points for first place and one point for last place. Oh, and just in case you're in a hurry, you can also jump past my reasoning and straight to the conclusions by skipping to this time marker. But for everyone else, let's break this down a bit. So starting with the low hanging fruit, I bought each of these from the local hardware store, meaning that for that category, they're all tied with six points. Next, all of these options are considered to be rust and weather resistant, but that's mostly because I specifically chose those options where available. And remember, it's not just about the metal parts, because I also chose ties that were UV resistant so that the plastic wouldn't break down in the sun. And I'd probably consider sealing that wooden strapping in some way as well. But either way, I'll give them each six points in that category too. Plus, all of these options used tools that most people already have at home. So again, six points each. But here's where we should start to see some differences. For ease of use, the lath screws obviously take first prize, followed closely by the screws and washers. Then surprisingly to me, I'd rank the fencing staples in third place, then the strapping, zip ties, and in last place, the wire. Again, none of these were truly difficult, but some were definitely easier than others. And next up, it's a little unfair to judge the wear and tear on the fencing based on only trying these on a few posts, but no matter what, the plastic zip ties are just never going to wear through the metal chicken wire. So in this category, they should come first. But after that, I think I can just rank the rest of them based on how much surface area they cover and on how little movement and friction they allow. So with that in mind, I think the strapping would have to come in second place, followed by the washers, and then the ever so slightly smaller lath screws. After that come the fencing staples, since despite having a small surface area, they still provide a tight hold and have no sharp edges. And finally, in last place, the wire wrap, because it's harder to make tight and the thin wire on wire contact is likely to be a weak point. But now for their ability to actually remain attached to the fence posts, which again seem to be the biggest problem we had with the regular staples. For this, I think all three of the screw-based options should get full points, followed very closely by the fencing staples, then the wire. And I'll put the zip ties in last place in this category for the same reason that I put them in first place in the previous category. Because if it comes between the plastic ties and the metal wire, the ties are almost certainly going to wear out first. Now, to be perfectly honest, this category is pretty arbitrary because I really can't imagine any of them coming loose over time and we can't prove it until we've used them for a full season. So at this point, with only one criterion left, the lath screws are in first place and the wire is in last. But depending on the size of your fence, the cost could quickly become a deciding factor. So. Let's add that in. In our case, we have 21 fence posts, and we'll assume that we need five fasteners per post. In reality, we may require a few more or a few less, but five makes for easy math. So five fasteners times 21 posts means that I'll calculate the cost for each method based on a total of 105 fasteners. Plus, in the case of the strapping, we'll also add in 21 one by twos. Oh, and all of these are in Canadian dollars, and for simplicity, I didn't include any taxes. But after doing the math, the cheapest option by a country mile is the fencing staples at approximately three cents each or about $3 for the entire fence. In second place come the lath screws at about eight cents each for a total of $8.40. Next come the plastic zip ties at 15 cents each or about 1575 total. Then in fourth place, we have the wire at 17 cents per foot and a half, which seems to be a rough average of the length needed for two wraps and a twist. Of course, depending on the diameter of the post. 
Once again, you could probably get away with a little less and may sometimes need a little more, but either way, that gives us a total of $17.85. And now, this one shocked me a little bit, but in fifth place, we have the combination of screws and washers. At 28 cents each for a total of nearly 30 bucks, that's 10 times the cost of the fencing staples and over three times the cost of the lath screws. Now, you may be able to find a better deal on washers, but for me, the cheapest option I could find for rust resistant washers was still 16 cents each, which is more expensive than the 12 cent screws that they each went with. But despite that, in a surprisingly distant last place, we have the wooden strapping. Once again, the deck screws were 12 cents each for a total of $12.60. But the 1x2s, because of the lumber pricing these days, were $2.78 each. Meaning that you could complete the entire fence using fencing staples for less than the cost of one single post using the deck screws and strapping. Anyway, for this method, we have a grand total of nearly $71. So now, if we add in those points and rearrange the score board based on the totals, we can see a fairly decisive win for the lad screws and an equally decisive loss for the wire wrapping. And all the rest are nearly tied in between. However, I should probably note that there are some pretty obvious flaws with my methodology in this ranking. For instance, I probably could have added extra weighting to some of the categories because, for example, the holding strength is far more important than the local availability. But that difference in their level of importance is not reflected in this simple comparison. Plus, the individual cost of each fastener was based on the price of the entire package divided by the number within the package. But, for example, I could buy deck screws in multiple multiples of 100, but the lath screws only came in multiples of 500. And since I'd only need 105 fasteners for the entire fence, that means I'd have nearly 400 lath screws left over. But unless I need those for another project, perhaps it would be more fair to count the cost of the entire pack, which would increase our lath screw total to $38.92, which is a pretty big difference from the $8 I mentioned a moment ago. So anyway, this isn't a perfect comparison, but it's probably best that I not lose sight of the fact that we're still just talking about a garden fence here, and I think I've already more than overcomplicated it enough. All right, so in conclusion, I'd say that any of these options will likely work just fine. But based on this test, I think I would have to personally choose either the lath screws or the fencing staples. They're both super cheap, easy to install, and should hopefully last a really long time. Oh, and if we were to construct this fence all over again, but using one of these fasteners from the beginning, I think I'd probably still choose to use a few of those T50 staples just until we got everything lined up. Because you just can't beat the one-handed simplicity of a semi-automatic staple gun, especially when using your other hand to stretch the chicken wire and hold everything in place. So regular old staples do have their place, they just probably shouldn't be considered a permanent solution. Anyway, with the decision finally made, I guess I should probably head back out to the fence and put some more of those lath screws in the rest of the posts. But in the meantime, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon. Have you ever put a significant amount of time and energy into solving a problem only to discover that it might not have even been a problem in the first place? Well, that's about how I felt after putting most of this video together. Because it was only then that it first occurred to me that perhaps the simple T50 staples could have worked after all, if only we'd known a bit more about them up front. Because as you're likely aware, there are a lot of different types of staples on the market and they come in a huge range of shapes, sizes, thicknesses, and materials. But they all share three basic parts. The crown, this horizontal section at the top, the legs, and the points. And in the case of our T50 staples, the type that work in a regular staple gun, they're defined as having a flat crown that's 10 millimeters, or 3 eighths of an inch wide. They typically come in different leg lengths, from quarter inch to 9 sixteenths, and there are two basic styles of points. Chisel, where both legs are sharpened symmetrically when viewed from the front, and divergent, where both legs are sharpened in opposite directions when viewed from the side. And as it turns out, when choosing the right staple for our fencing, it's those last two parts that may have deserved a bit more consideration. Because it's possible that getting them wrong could have contributed to our main two problems. The staple's lack of holding strength, and the wear and tear on our chicken wire. 
For example, I initially chose the 9 16 leg length, simply because I assumed that, like a screw, the longer the staple, the better it would hold. And generally speaking, that is true, assuming the entire staple is able to penetrate the material you're attempting to fasten. You see, there are a few general rules of thumb when deciding which staple length you should choose, mostly having to do with the thickness and density of the materials you're fastening. But the most important thing to remember is that if the crown of your staple doesn't rest flush after being inserted, then the staple is likely too long, and you should use a shorter size instead. And unfortunately, when we once again look closer at the staples on our posts, you'll see that many of them stick out slightly, meaning that shorter staples may have been more appropriate. But why is this a problem? Well, because loose staples allow the chicken wire to move around in the wind and under the weight of climbing animals. And over time, that extra movement can cause wear on the fencing and can slowly wiggle the staple free. But there's more. Because I also chose staples with a regular old chisel point mostly because I didn't even realize there was a difference. But in hindsight, I think a divergent point might have been a better choice. You see, since the points are sharpened in opposite directions, they cause the legs to flare out when inserted, rather than going in straight like the chisel points. And this extra flare is said to result in a much stronger hold, sort of like how a drywall anchor works. So to test this new theory, I drove back to the local hardware store and purchased a pack of these 3 8 of an inch divergent point staples. You can tell the difference by the serrated edge on the divergent points versus the flat edge on the chisel points. And since these staples are slightly shorter, they fully penetrate the fence post every single time, unlike the 9 16 which are a bit more hit and miss. So, so far so good. But in order to test the holding strength, I decided to staple a scrap piece of chicken wire onto another post out in our orchard area and then use this luggage scale to measure the force required to pull it free. And in the case of the original staples, it took 42 pounds when pulling straight out, and 70 pounds when pulling straight down. I figured that would loosely simulate both the horizontal force of the wind and the vertical force of a climbing raccoon. So if the problem with our original staples was just that they were too long and had the wrong point, then the new T50 staples should require more force to remove them. But to my surprise, it wasn't even close, because they only required 21 pounds when pulling straight out, and 30 pounds when pulling straight down, meaning that our original staples had roughly double the holding strength as compared to the new ones, and therefore the preceding experiments and ranking were not rendered completely unnecessary. But just in case, like me, you're now curious about how the other fasteners would stack up with this new luggage scale test, I decided to check the rest of them as well. And so the fencing staples required 53 pounds to pull straight out, which was fairly impressive, but honestly not as much of an improvement over the originals as I had expected. However, when pulling straight down, I maxed out the scale before it would come free, and happily all of the rest of the fasteners held strong in both directions, and the chicken wire tore apart long before any of them had even budged. So then, why did I bother sharing all of this bonus info with you? Well, for starters, I hope that some of you will have found it as interesting as I did, and I figured that others might have already known about the different types of points and lengths, and therefore had been curious if that was the problem all along. But mostly, I just think it's important that we share our mistakes just as openly as our successes, and that when trying to learn from others' experiences, it's still useful to see the things that didn't go as expected. And sometimes it's worth following a tangent even if it results in a dead end. So with that, I really hope you found this video helpful. But no matter what, I appreciate you sticking around to the end. So thanks again for watching, and we'll see you soon.